All right. Well, welcome to Friday Senior Connections Lunch. It's 11.33, and we're going to start. Ray has joined us before for a very enthralling discussion and presentation on Meteor Impact Structures, which is pretty cool. And we recorded that one, and I put it online, and it got a few hits. So... I'm hoping this one becomes is as popular. This was actually the result of somebody requesting that he talk about Fossil Gorge. So I appreciate him kind of coming to the call and request and being really excited about it. So I'm going to let you take over, Ray, and I'm going to show okay, you. Okay. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, Devonian Fossil Gorge is a pretty neat thing. We were pretty lucky in Johnson County to get this, I think, as a geologist. I mean, the circumstances around it might not have been so good. But here's a story of the Devonian Fossil Gorge. Uh, this is a view of the Coralville Dam looking straight down on it. Uh, Iowa River flows south up to the top of the screen and the Coralville Lake's behind it. Well, the dam has an emergency spillway because it's just made out of earth and rock and if the water went over, it eroded down in no time at all. So if the water gets too high, it spills out along the emergency spillway uh, and around the dam so it saves the dam. Well, the top part of the emergency spillway is all uh, concrete because that's where most of the energy is dissipated. But then below that, they just ran it off into a, an area that would dump into the river. So that's what it looks like now if you stand on the road and look down Devonian Fossil Gorge. This is beautiful for we geologists. We like to see that rock exposure. You know, we don't see a lot of it around this area. Well, here we go. We're back to the dam again. This is an airplane view out the side, of course. Here's the dam, emergency spillways there. This area over here is the Cottonwood Campground, which was one of the reservoir campgrounds that, that people could stay at. Well, it's parked right in the path of the spillway. So uh, that's where Devonian Fossil Gorge ended up being, right in that area there. Hang on a second. I'll quiet this phone. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't turn that one off, unfortunately. <laughs> Anyway, that's where Devonian Fossil Gorge is going to show up, right there where the Cottonwood Campground was. So what happened back in 1993 in June and July, we had this weather system that was kind of stalled for a good part of the early summer. Uh, there was a big high pressure front or a big low of uh, unseasonably cold air coming down from the northwest. There was a big high out in the Atlantic, so the high was pushing everything to the west and the the, the low cold air was pushing everything to the east, and then the Gulf of Mexico sent all this nice moist air up into this region, and where the moist air got shoved up higher by the cold air and the, all the precipitation came out, we got a lot of rain in that period of time. Yeah, there's a Mississippi River drainage basin is the light color. It covers a good chunk of the U.S. Well, areas of flooding, the whole upper Mississippi River Valley was flooding. All the rivers and streams in that area was flooding. You see right in the center is Iowa, and right in the center of Iowa, that red outline is the Iowa River drainage basin. So all the water that falls in that area ends up coming downstream and boom to the dam and Devonian Fossil Gorge. Well, what happened then? Uh, the dam normally has a pool level of 683 feet. That means the water lies 683 feet above sea level. That's kind of the normal that they like to run it most of the time, sometimes a little higher in the summer. Uh, in 1993, on March 5th, it was up a little higher, around 700 feet. Uh, well, not too big a deal. It's a lot of area to spill out on before you get up to the flood level of 712. However, that June, we had over 12 inches of rain uh, all in the basin, and, and the reservoir went up rapidly until July 5th. It reached that flood stage. That's the maximum pool level. That's the point where it starts going over the spillway. They don't want it to go up too much higher on the dam, so the spillway starts to carry all the excess away. And in that period of time, basically, the river is out of the Corps of Engineers' control. Anything downstream is just on their own. Well, for 12 days, there was almost twice as much water coming in, 41,000 cubic feet per second, as opposed to the 25,000 that they could put out. So the water level was going up rapidly. And by July 24th, it reached its maximums, 716.7. So it was almost five feet above 
the level of the spillway. Then fortunately, it finally went down a little bit. By July 5th, it was down to the flood level again. So it quit going over the spillway on July 5th and then finally down to, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was August 7th. <laughs> I can't read my own writing. Then on, by August 18th, the, the floodgates were open and things were sort of back to normal. But in that flood period of time, it was pretty pretty dangerous and, uh, and uh, exotic situation. I'll tell you, the reservoir came up as you see the water level on the on the right there, finally going over the spillway, eroded away the cotton Cottonwood Canyon. Here's an actual photograph, aerial photograph of the area at the time of the flooding. You can see the spillway, you see the water flowing through Devonian Fossil Gorge. It was eroding away uh, a lot of the campground and a lot of other ground around there. Meanwhile, as I said, the river was out of control. Downstream, if you went to Iowa City, here's the information kiosk on Dubuque Street if you happen to go that way. This was 1993 again. There's the Mayflower Apartments and the Mayflower Dorm, all of Dubuque Street, flooded underwater. City Park, there you go. And if you looked out in Coralville, this is the Coralville Strip uh, running from left to right on your picture. And at First Avenue goes to the north toward the bottom of the picture there. That's heading out toward the freeway. Uh, so you see the Iowa River up in the upper corner there, Iowa River Landing. Well, look at all the water. This is from Clear Creek was was backed up you see clear creek up toward the top of the thing there it runs through the middle of this all these areas were flooded the coralville strips totally underwater first avenue is totally underwater peking buffet all those things uh a lot of you remember that well a professor of ours uh, at the time brian glenister lived out in the coralville reservoir it had a nice overlook that i used to call Glen glenister point and uh this is what the reservoir should look like this time of year if you looked at it uh uh, before the, the reservoir went up. So when the water went up, this is what it looked like. You think it didn't come up a long way? Here's the uh, interstate bridge over the reservoir. The water is right up to the bottom of the bridge. Flowing over the dam, August, July 5th through August 7th, it went over the spillway there. Dams in the background is protected by this emergency spillway. And then it ran down that concrete apron and then into the campground area. And that's where all the rapids and stuff that you see here are. That's because it's eroding away all of the material in there. Roaring down through that area that's going to be devoting a fossil gorge. You see just eroding away chunks of bank blasting through there. It's an incredible flow of water. There are some pretty nice videos about it. You can see some things, uh, some videos like this actually at the Corps of Engineers Information Center if you want it. Well, this is a road that went down to the uh, tailwater area down there. Uh, the road is still there today, except this flood peeled the asphalt off of it. And when the water went down, this is what Devonian and Fossil Gorge looked like. This was the emergency spillway. Here's where the original campground was, up here at this level. So you see how much was washed away and washed right down to bedrock, the first rock unit. So this is much more resistant and it could hold up in the, in the flow of water. Well, this was an incredible thing for we geologists. You know, we toil in obscurity. Nobody cares about geology and stuff. Then all of a sudden, here's this big thing. And it was a big public deal. They were talking about it in newspapers everywhere. Paul Harvey was on it on the radio. Uh, we had a half a million people show up at that area in that area in the fall just because they heard about it and wanted to stop in and see it. We had people coming from, from other parts of the country. People would be going down the freeway and see the sign and recognize it. And they're all interested in geology and they're all down there, their hands and knees looking at fossils. It was really pretty cool. Well, the Corps of Engineers realized that that was pretty popular too. And so they decided to, to let a volunteer group put together a nice little plaza and kind of fix it up and leave it that way so that people could come up and look at the geology. Originally, the Corps was thinking of filling it back in, getting their campground back, but they uh, fortunately relented and, and decided to go ahead with this concept. Well, this gentleman, again, the fellow that had the space out on the reservoir, Brian Glenister, some of you may know him or his wife, Ann, who had the orchid shop. Anyway, uh, he was the one that spearheaded this whole thing, got together with quarry people, a bunch of other people and organizations, and they came up with some money, hired an architect, and they got a, a plan put together. And by gosh, they built this beautiful visitor center. This is just outside of the the plaza area, Devotee and Fossil Gorge. So volunteers planned, collected donations, and constructed all of this information. 
If you go on the inside of the plaza here, again, you can see these stones with a descriptive pass information on, a, on the displays there. The geological survey was busy looking at all of the rocks out in the area at the time, and including me. We were having a lot of fun out here, I'll tell you. Uh, looking at all these rocks at the time, we'd, we'd seen all these rocks before in quarries. There wasn't anything new, but it was really nice to see them all exposed out here together. And so we put together a little chart, a little pamphlet, I mean, for people to follow that I might also like to see those rocks. If you open it up, you see there's a series of points that we identified where there were especially interesting fossils or something like that. And uh, the group that was fixing this up put out some little monuments, these little brass monuments uh, in each of these positions. So you could use this, this chart and you could follow and find these little monuments and then it would tell you what's going on in there that particular area. So this was really nice. Got a lot of people out here. A lot of people liked it. Uh, things were rolling on real good. The only problem was, you can see a little bit of grass growing in the background of that photograph there. Uh, vegetation was starting to take it over and, uh, and a lot of the areas became swamps and wetlands, but there's still lots of rocks to, for people to see and lots of these little plaques for them to go identify fossils. Well, in 2008, it happened again. Clouded up, rained like heck, and the reservoir flooded. Here's a picture looking off the dam out toward the reservoir. You can see the, the little buildings by the beach right over there. Over the spillway, the water went again and then blasted down through Devotee and Fossil Gorge. Flooded downtown Coralville again. Here's First Avenue again. That Coralville Strip runs up and down in this particular picture. Uh, everything's flooded again. Here's the Iowa River with City Park, Dubuque Street, and Mayflower Dorms. And the University of Iowa really took a hit in this particular flood. In this particular area here, we can see Hatcher Auditorium, which, which uh, took a $13 million loss for that. The Voxman and Clapp Music Buildings and Recital Halls, another $13 million. The University Theater had $4.5 million worth of damage. Art West, $12 million worth of damage. The art museum itself, $4 million worth of damage. In this picture, we even see it damaged the art school up in the very far corner, $7 million. Here's the footbridge across here, $1.5 million worth of damage. You add all these up, there's $55 million worth of damage just in that picture there. All told, the university had $232 million worth of damage from that flood. Quite an ordeal, I'll tell you. But meanwhile, back at Devonia Fossil Gorge, we find that the flood waters washed away all of those, those uh, wetlands and the swamps and the vegetation and exposed even more rock. It didn't cut very much deeper, just made it wider, exposed more rock. So more things for us to look at. So we got to really to work on it. And uh, the main rocks we're looking at there are called the Cedar Valley Group rocks. It's particularly, it's the Cedar Valley, uh, particularly it's a rapid member of these rocks. So we have the rapid member of the Little Cedar Formation of the Cedar Valley Group of the Devonian. That's how we geologists classify these things. So if we look at a stratigraphic chart, this is a chart that shows all the geologic units in Iowa in the proper order. And we zoom in on this area at the top here. There's the Devonian. Here's the Cedar Valley Group, kind of in the middle of the Devonian there. And if we split out that Cedar Valley Group, we see the Little Cedar Formation and the rapid and the very top of the Solon members that are exposed here at Devonian Fossil Gorge. On top of that, the really cool thing about this is these are what are called bedding plane exposures. Most of the rock that you see driving around Iowa or, or moving around anywhere are these road cuts like this. These are vertical exposures. It's like taking a chop through a piece of cake or something. You don't really see what's on the, on the top of the cake. But we're looking at bedding plane exposures here. It's just like you were walking around on the Devonian seafloor. So all the animals and everything that died in these particular areas are going to be preserved there just as they were uh, when the next unit of rock came down on top of them. So this is a wonderful place for us to go look at these rocks and, and learn a lot about the rocks. So what do we know about the Devonian rocks in this period of time? Well, this is a kind of a map projection that I like to use a lot. It's called a Moldvita projection.
projection. It's like you took a world globe and put a slice in it and took your fingers and it peeled it open. So that's the kind of projection we're looking at. So here's the world as it looks today. If we go back and look at the Devonian or 380 million years ago or so, we see it looks a lot different. The continents are different. There's two major supercontinents at this time, or two major big continents at this time, Laurentia and Gondwanda. And you can see the various parts of uh, uh, today's continents and where they were distributed at this time. Here's the United States. Well, most of it anyway is on North America. Part of it was actually part of Africa at that time. Uh, but that's the way they were distributed. And there's, whoops, there's Iowa right in the middle. Well, if we zoom in a little bit on Iowa, uh, what we can see is uh, there's shallow sea, this light blue color is shallow sea, the darker blue is deeper, and then the deep ocean is actually the darkest blue out here. And there you can see Iowa located. It's an area there where there's a lot of shallow seas going off into the continent. And why is that? Well, here's the edge of North America, and here's the edge of Gauganda. And the two continents are crashing together. And as they push together, the continent of Laurasia gets a little bit wrinkled. And when it wrinkles, the low areas fill in with water from the ocean and uh, high areas go up a little higher. So you get a deposition of a lot of ocean rocks in Iowa at that time. Not only that, there were a number of types of rocks being deposited because you were right on the shore. You could have things like the super tidal flat at the very top. This is just above high tide line. Uh, but you know, a lot of the influences of the ocean are affecting it. Then below that, the lagoon, you get a little deeper, you get to places where the water is maybe uh, a little more restricted. In some areas, it, it uh, doesn't have good circulation. Other areas, a little higher or a little lower. Particular forms of life and organisms like particular depths of water, plus the, or the types of limestone that is deposited is going to vary depending on how active the, the current is and things things like that. So we learn a lot about these. We call these facies. So the water was sometimes high like this and sometimes low. And we could tell when it was high or low by looking at the various facies relationship. In other words, if it's uh, a deep water facies and then above that is a shallow water facies, we know that the, the water level has come down on the ocean. So by putting all that together, we can have a series of cycles of the sea level going up and down and up and down. And we can figure that out by looking at the rocks. And that's what you see here. This is time going in this direction, getting older toward the top. And this is the area that was flooded by the ocean, getting deeper. So at any given spot, you can see how the sea was fluctuating with time. Well, here's where the rocks that we're looking at were deposited, right in here. So we start out at a pretty shallow area right near the top there on, on, on the bottom where we're at the top of that peak. That's shallow. And that's the kind of environment that we get uh, a lot of fossils and things like that. And then as we get in deeper water, the conditions aren't very good and there aren't so many fossils. And then you see on the far side, uh, upper top of that yellow band, uh, we're going back up again. And we can see all of these in the rocks. This is what we call a stratigraphic section. We actually went through and looked at all of these rocks and identified particular beds where we could see things changing and, uh, and, and worked out this whole sequence. And this is the subdivision for these rocks here. Here's a little closer view of just that illustration. These rocks down here we call the Sinatropa beds. This is an area at a time when the seas that covered this area were shallow enough where you get lots of fossils. We particularly got these brachiopods called atropus or spin atropus in this particular case. And then as the water got deeper, we got into rocks that didn't have so many fossils, it was mostly mudstone. And these are called the key beds, or sometimes we refer to them as the Z beds. But we'll call them the key beds today. And then above there, remember the water was shallowing again. And so we got actually into some coral reef type features we call the lower rapid biostrome that's just loaded with corals. Well, what are some other rocks that we could see on Devonian Fossil Gorge? Well, these giant ones that they made all of the markers out of and all of the columns out of, these are a little different rocks. These are the Silurian Dolomite of the Anamosa member of the Gower Formation, it's called. These are older. If we look at our stratigraphic column again, Devonian Gorge Fossil, Devonian Fossil Gorge rocks are up there at the top in the Cedar Valley, and we have to go down about 50 million years or earlier, 50 million years older, to find the, the Silurian rocks of Gower Formation that these things were deposited. So these are actually 
quarried in Stone City near Anamosa, where they have a big quarry for doing just this kind of thing. And these rocks work real well for that. So since we can't have any local rocks, that they just aren't quarried around here for that. We had got to get the closest ones we could. So we have Anamosa beds there. And you see the same things if you go inside the plaza. There's another rock that's showing here in the plaza. You see it in these little plaques here. This is a Coralville formation, which lies just above the kind of rocks we see in the reservoir, in the spillway for the most part. These are called the Idiostroma beds. They're very pretty. Uh, this was actually a unit that was was mined by people back in the 1800s and they made cane handles and things like that out of them. And it was called uh, Iowa City Marble. So it's a pretty interesting rock. Well, anyway, we, there was a fountain that was put in at the same time that we built the plaza, and the fountain was made out of the same rock. See, if, if you look at them closely there, it's the same type of rock. Unfortunately, this rock is very pretty, but it doesn't stand up good to the weather. And so after a few years, it started to fall apart, and we eventually had to replace it with one made out of the Silurian rock that's much more, much more vigorous. Well, there's tons of fossils at Devonian Fossil Gorge. I mentioned that. That's one of the reasons it's so popular. The Iowa has so many neat fossils. Uh, it, it's just really incredible. And, and for people can, that aren't used to looking at these things can come and see all sorts of nice things. This is just one picture from one of our, uh, one of our points uh, in the reservoir or in the spillway, in the Devonian Gorge, I'm sorry. Here you see. Uh, a couple of trilobites. That's what these uh, these uh, spike-shaped things are. A trilobite was a little critter that skittered along on the seafloor. We also have bryzoans. These are kind of like uh, uh, sea fans that we see today. And there's a picture of a, a modern bryzoan right there. You can see that's kind of what they look like. We have bryzoans here. Uh, I don't have to look very far to find crinoids. These are also called sea lilies. And brachiopods are kind of clam-like shells, but they're actually attached to the seafloor. So we get all of these things and more, and it's really just fascinating to look at these. Now, now one interesting thing, if you happen to come into town and look at, at McBride Hall, uh, the Iowa Hall display in McBride Hall walks you through geologic time, and there's a beautiful diorama there of the Devonian. And it turns out that we see almost exactly the same rocks portrayed in this diorama, which was opened in 1985, long before the 93 flood. But all the same rocks in the seafloor that we're looking at, Devonian Fossil Gorge is exposed. Uh, you can see what it would have looked like in real life right here by looking at this diorama. So we'll use a lot of these pictures to show what's going on. Here's some of these crinoids. These are the, the sea lily type things that we see. And there's crinoids around today too. We have a couple of primary varieties around today. We have these feather stars, which are actually free swimming uh, crinoids. They look, look like a bunch of feathers flapping in the wind when they're swimming. They're really pretty amazing. And then there's also these crinoids that are attached to the seafloor, like, like these. They're usually found in, in much deeper water, uh, unlike the way they used to be in the Devonian Fossil Gorge time. But these look a lot like the, the crinoids that we do see at Devonian Fossil Gorge. So there's a picture from Iowa Hall in a little drawing of a crinoid. A crinoid is actually an animal but it has these things hold fast, they're called, that look a lot like roots. It has what looks like a stalk, which we call a columnal, and it's made up of a lot of little disks, all calcium carbonate, all calcite or limestone. Uh, the, the animal actually builds its shell out of these things. And you see a little hole in the center of the columnal. That, that kind of runs, uh, you know, like a spinal co to column would up through the middle of this animal. Uh, at the very top, you see the cup. That's where the animal's head and everything were and the arms, and the arms could wave in the current and bring food down into the center of the cup there where the mouth was. So that's how those guys worked. Here's an example of what might look like out of Devonian Fossil Gorge is a long string of, the, of, of columnals put together to form a, a stem type thing you can see preserved there. And these holes in the center come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. So that's one of the things that help us tell one crinoid from the other. Well, here's a photograph from one of, the, one of the discovery points at Devonian, at Devonian Fossil Gorge where you can see some really interesting crinoid pieces. You see some of the long stalks there. You see some of the round disks. And particularly this feature here is a calyx or a cup. Now, that calyx is very rarely preserved. Uh, these animals 
once they die, uh, they they're decay rapidly and they fall into a series of these little plates that make up the animal uh, within a day or so. So these animals to be preserved intact like this have to be buried alive by a storm that kicked up a bunch of mud and actually buried them or something like that. So those are very rare, but you can see them out Devonian Fossil Gorge if you're sharp. This is one of the really special ones that we, we uh, collected there. This is the first time this one has ever been seen, and so it's actually described. Its type section is right here at the Bodium Fossil Gorge. Well, while, while I'm talking about crinoids, I'll introduce you to my little friend, Floyd the Noid here. This is one of the things that the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society is trying to, to promote right now. We've been doing this for the last two or three years, trying to get the Iowa legislature to designate the crinoid as the Iowa state fossil. Iowa is one of the few states, I think maybe one of nine or 10, that don't have a state fossil. And uh, why not? We ought to have a state fossil. And the crinoid is perfect. Iowa is just world famous for really well-preserved, spectacular crinoids from all over the place. So uh, if you want to help us out, you can talk to your legislature and tell them to make a crinoid the state fossil. Anyway, getting back to business here. Another fossil you'll see there are the brachiopods. I said they look like clamshells, except they're attached by a little foot-like thing to the seafloor. It's called a pedicle. And uh, so they open and their, their shells and fill their water just like a clam, except they're attached to the seafloor. And you see lots of those uh, various variety. Here's a bunch of atropids. These are the spin atropids that, uh, that I talked about earlier. There's also these spearfer ones, which are really fine to find. I call them winged spearfers sometimes. They kind of have that wing shape on them here. I've outlined a couple of them here, but if you're sharp, you can see two or three others in that picture. Eight. Corals, we got corals galore. This is a modern coral reef, of course. It's got a diver in the background, but the, the coral reefs back then were pretty similar, pretty similar. Here's the uh, Iowa Hall illustration again there's three types of corals shown here the hexagonaria and the favocytes are both colonial corals that's corals that was kind of like a coral apartment house with lots of individual animals living all connected together and then there are some solitary or horn corals shown in a couple other areas of the diorama here's what they look like this is the hexagonaria and there's an illustration of what it looked like on the on the left there, you can see the top surface with the animals lived inside those little holes and they would, they would come out and fill their water for food. And when a predator came around, they'd sit back into those holes and protect themselves. Uh, there's an example of one of those on the right there and then a cross section down below. Another coral is a favocytes. It's kind of like the hexagon area. The hexagon area, I should have mentioned, is was named that because its little cells have a nice hexagonal shape to them, and they're rather large. The favocytes, these little cells that the animals live in, individual animal lives in each of these now. These things are much smaller and will tend to be a little rounder. Uh, so this is a colonial coral favocytes. Horn corals look kind of like this. It's an individual animal has his own house. You see a lot of those around the Devonian Fossil Gorge. As a matter of fact, here's uh, three photographs of, of solitary corals seen in cross-section and then looking from the top down on them in a kind of combination of both in various places at the coral that were at the Devonian Fossil Gorge. Won't have any trouble finding them. And if you want to find the colonial corals, there's this thing called the biostrome, which is uh, what we call Discovery Point 3, DP3. That's how they're listed on those brochures. So this is Discovery 3. Point three, right here. We, as a matter of fact, we put a little plaza around this because it's a very popular place for people to come and look at these rocks. So this is the Biostrome Plaza. Uh, lots of corals in there. If we zoom in and take a look at those rocks, you see how lumpy these things are? These are individual corals here. Favocytes and hexagon area. And it's interesting because they're not in life position here. They're tumbled around. Uh, just like any coral reef, these were sitting very near the surface of the ocean. And every time a hurricane or a tidal wave or something came by, I would break them up and tumble them around. And so that's what you see here in a lot of different positions. There's also another exposure of the biostrome, another data uh, discovery point that we have that's on the other side of the road that goes down to the, to the reservoir there and it's discovery point 18 you'll see the same things but uh, a little more from the top rather than the side 
Now, this rapid biostrom was more or less like a coral reef, and uh, and geologists can look at rock exposures and, and drill core and things like that, and they can follow this reef all the way from Illinois across to Iowa and into Minnesota. So this is kind of like the Great Barrier Reef of its time, a rapid biostrom. There are actually two of these. Uh, this one got buried, and another one formed above it. Some other animals that we're going to see uh, at Devonian Fossil Gorge, and we also would see in the Devonian Sea back then, include cephalopods. Cephalopods are like squid with shells, and here's one right now, as we see it at Devonian Fossil Gorge. This is uh, one of the types that we saw, and the other one is below. So ammonite is kind of a coiled one. It's got a curled uh, cephalopod, and nautiloids are the straight-shelled ones. This would be a, an ammonite of some kind on the, on the right there. It start to coil. We don't have maybe the whole thing preserved, or, or maybe it never got beyond that. There's all kinds of different types of ammonites. But uh, cephalopods are one of the things you can find out there. One of the really rare things that I was surprised to see, I saw more out there than I have seen everywhere else combined in my life, <clears throat> are these things called conulares. This is what it looks like when it's nice and fresh broken out in the rock, and you can barely see this little cone-shaped feature kind of in the center of the picture. This is what the animal looked like, they think. We really don't know a whole lot about conulares. It's, it's, it's thought that they were probably a sponge of some kind, but there's really nothing like them alive today. Uh, there were actually Actually, some areas with a lot of these things exposed, dozens of them exposed. Uh, after a little time, they start to dry out and they begin to look like this, where you can kind of faintly see them, but it's not real clear. And uh, given a couple weeks, they were gone entirely. Just couldn't see them at all. So uh, you had to be there when they were freshly exposed to see the conularids. Trilobites are another popular thing that everybody likes to see. We call them trilobites because their body type has three main lobes, kind of a right, left, and a center lobe. Here's a picture from uh, Iowa Hall diorama of the Devonian. You see this little guy scurrying along the seafloor there. It looks a little bit like a sow bug. Probably relates more to a horseshoe crab than anything else that we see today. It had a head, a thorax, and a tail. And this tail section seems to be what's mostly preserved. And I, I don't know why that is. But you see a lot of trilobite tails uh, around Devonian Fossil Gorge. These are a couple more I showed you earlier. These are both tails also. So that's what you usually see with trilobites. You can see gastropods or snails. They were pretty common. Snails are one of the hardiest animals that we, we have. They live everywhere. They live in trees. They live in the bottom of the ocean and everywhere in between. And they're, they're really uh, able to adapt to a lot of environments. Uh, another under interesting one you see are sponges. We see uh, a couple of different types of sponges. The encrusting sponges are like this uh, layer of brown that's wrapped around this coral here in the coral below. This is an encrusting stromatoproid, a sponge that just layered itself on top of some other animal. Then we have these little finger strobs. They're like individual digits of your finger that grow separately out in, into the seafloor. There are also some of these bigger stroms, kind of flat pancake-shaped guys around. So stromatoproids or sponges are, are pretty numerous out in this area. So one big thing you see when you get into Iowa Hall, the thing that attracts your attention more than anything else is this giant fish coming out of here. This is an arthrodire placoderm. That's the type of fish it is. This one's called Dunkleostis. Well, Dunkleostis was a pretty rough character. This was that number one predator of its time. How big were they? Well, here's a school bus. Uh, Dunkleostis got to be 60 feet long, longer than a school bus. You see the great white shark below him there that's dwarfed, and then toward his head below is a, is a diver that's dwarfed. So these were the prime predators at the time. They weighed as much as 70 tons. That's as much as 10 elephants. So these were big critters. And uh, sure enough, we found a piece of one at the Devonian Fossil Gorge. You see here, we've cut it out and put it in the display uh, at the visitor center at the gorge. But if you look at the illustration in the lower left, that yellow area is called a medial dorsal plate. That's one of the big plates in the back of the head. And that's what we have preserved here. Uh, our geology it was actually discovered by some little kid who pointed at a 
funny shaped puddle and said to the professor nearby, what, what's this professor? And he sloshed the water away and there it was. So our geologists kind of got to work cleaning around it to see how much was there. Uh, this is Brian Witzke from the Iowa survey being supervised by a, a couple kids. We also had a guest geologist who came to help us with that. Uh, I don't know if you recognize him or not, but if you're in the dinosaurs at all, this is Bob Bakker, the famous dinosaur paleontologist who came to Iowa City to give a talk one time and came out to Gorge and helped us with this, with this uh, big bone. Well, eventually uh, the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society people came out and they sought out some of these better fossils for us to put on display uh, up at the visitor center. None of these were kept by the individuals. These were all sought out by the club members for the display. As a matter of fact, the club members took them home and prepared them, cleaned them up and made them uh, look nicer for the display. Uh, so the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society did a lot here. Well, after they cut these out, they would kind of cut around them down to a bed where they could split it out and then they would split the block out. So if you go out to Devonian Fossil Gorge, you'll see some places like this where rocks were really cut out of there. So that's not vandals or anything, but he's stealing anything. That was just our group partaking these uh, fossils that are going to be damaged eventually by people walking on them and stuff and, and, and uh, putting them in the visitor center where people can look at them for years. This is a good example of one of those, this, this crinoid that was a type crinoid. That's on display. Well, one of the things that you see of most more than anything else in the rocks of Devonian Fossil Gorge is lime mud. This is a picture I took up in Mandarina Bay in Florida. This is a part of Florida Bay, and this is mud, just lime mud. So it's calcium carbonate mud, really goopy, yicky stuff to walk in. It forms a rock, however, that's called a lithographic limestone. It's completely smooth. It breaks like glass at these kind of conchoidal fractures, you know, and it's really smooth and doesn't have any fossils or anything in it to mess it up. So there's a good reason it's called lithographic limestone. Before the days of modern printing, they take a slab of this stuff, polish it down, and actually etch it so that uh, parts of it let, were, were in relief, and then they could use printers and can actually print pictures and stuff with it. So this was a lithographic stone. We actually quarried some of these in Iowa and produced them for, for a few years. Well, where does all of this fine lime mud come from? Well, it comes primarily from algae, green algae. These are some of the green algae that we see in Florida day, Bay today, Eudota, Penicillus, and Halamita. These algae are kind of interesting because they grow these little calcium carbonate needles all over their skin in order to stop predators from, from eating them. Thalassia grass is another biologic thing there that does kind of the same thing, produces these little calcium carbonate crystals on the outside. So that discourages the predators from, from gnawing on them. However, uh, when, that, when the plants die, then those things fall as little particles of calcium carbonate uh, clay size into the ground. And so you end up with this lime mud that's produced by all of those, those critters. So you can tell there's a lot of them around. And most of the fossils that you see here in uh, Devonian Fossil Gorge are preserved within this stuff. There's some other cool geologic features there, too. Uh, again, here's the lower rapid biostrome. This is at that, that plaza I showed you before they rebuilt it. You can see that curve here. This is a fold in the rock. This is what horizontal looks like. So that fold is, is really something. The rocks are actually bent. You can actually get fractures or faults uh, through these rocks. Here's another look at that particular fracture. Now, we're not, we call it a fracture, this particular one, because you have to prove that it actually moved up or down to know it's a fault. And there was really no way that we saw along this thing to prove that. However, other ones were different. Up toward the, toward the apron, where the concrete apron to the spillway was, we found this nice little thrust fault that runs along here. Pressure was being pushed, the crack was being pushed on from those sides like that. And when it was pushed, it kind of slipped up on the, on the far side, on the north side there, and down on the south side. So the total displacement there is nine feet. We know that because we know what the particular fossil beds on the upthrown side are and on the downthrown side there. So we can estimate how much movement there was. Nine feet of movement along that one. 
Well, that was after the 93 flood. After the 2008 flood, that actually got exposed quite a bit more. It's a beautiful fault zone. Great example to, to use to show people how a fault works, how beds go up and down, how the uh, <coughs> other fraction features can be seen. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out because when the Corps of Engineers redid the area, uh, there was our fracture underneath the road. So as you drive over that road, you think about our beautiful fault zone down there. Well, one of the things you see with these fault zones, as these things slide, as one rock slides along another, it tends to scratch it. And you get these grooves or lineation developed into the, into the rocks. These are called slick sides, and that's what geologists use as evidence of rock movement. See, if one slides along the other, it scratches it. And we can see these things in the rocks. Here's a kind of a high angle fault zone where the rock that, that you see there was scratched by one that probably slid down along it. Uh, here's another one here where geologist Jason is looking at this uh, series of slick sides. We know there's a fault zone there because of those features. We can also get low angle thrust faults that we see in the sides of the of the gorge sometimes. Here, for instance, you can see these little cracks here that indicate that that part got pushed up, that part got pushed up, that part got pushed up. That's what you do and you get a force pushing on a lot of these rocks and they fracture and kind of slide like that. One of the other really cool things that I, I think one of the coolest things, again, we're back at the plaza. We're looking at those idiostroma beds. Remember the, the ones that are a plaque there and the one that was the fountain at the time? Well, here's the rocks we usually see in Devonian Fossil Gorge down here. Uh, these rocks, the idiostroma beds, were deposited way up here. So those rocks have all been eroded everywhere else in the gorge, except if we look along this fault zone at Discovery Point 16, kind of down toward the, the, the river end of the, of the gorge, we see rocks in there like this one. Look real close and what do you see? That is a piece of idiostroma bed. Well, how did that get way down here in with these much older rocks? Well, what we think happened is this fault zone opened up like a crack, a chunk of that fell down and got stuck in the hole. Then as the area eroded down to that point, they exposed it. And so we think that that rock has come down a big fracture zone. So this is actually be the biggest uh, fault that we see displacement right here, probably. Here's another view of another fold. Well, how do all these things get here? What produces all of these structural features? There's a, there's a couple of things that geologists can tell you were going on at this time. Here we look at the Cedar Valley group again and the Wapsi Pinnacle group below it. If we look inside at those units we see, and then here's where the Devonian Fossil Gorge rocks are, you go down a little lower, you see these pink units here. These are actually gypsum beds. They were deposited as gypsum. Well, after this area became, became uh, exposed to the erosion and, and land surface and the sea went away, groundwater came through and dissolved that gypsum away. So that upper unit collapsed down in there. We got all this broken up rock or breccia, and uh, you got some deformation up here. So that's one way it could have formed. And we do know that some of the deformation was caused by that. But there's a lot of other deformation that doesn't really fit that scenario. Now, I mentioned before that we had Laurasia and Gondwana, and that the two were crashing together. <coughs> they kind of came together. Uh, like a zipper from the top down. Here's Iowa kind of in the middle of this collision. Well, the first area to contact was up here in the north called the Taconic Orogeny. And so this area was crashing together between about 550 and 440 million years ago. Then some of the lower area crashed together down here, what's called the Allegheny Orogeny. That ran in that area, mostly in the southeast U.S., you see that, uh, between about 350 and 260 million years ago. Then kind of overlapping that came the Wachita orogeny, where South America plowed into us from the south there and uh, deformed a lot of things between about 1318 and, or 318 and 271 million years ago. So that was a time uh, we had rocks in Iowa called the Pennsylvania, and this is Pennsylvania time. If we look at the rocks that we see in Iowa, we see a lot Lot of structural activity going on there. Way just to the southwest of us there in Kansas and Nebraska is the Nemaha uplift. That was a big ridge that was uplifted along a Humboldt fault zone. A fracture happened and the land up to the west got pushed up hundreds and hundreds of feet. There was also a fault, a crack in the ground where the, the area to the north came up hundreds of feet. And that's called the Thurman Redfield fault zone that ran up there. 
we see the Plum River Fault Zone and the Iowa City Clinton Fault Zone were formed during the Pennsylvanian at that same time. And uh, here's the Devonian Fossil Gorge right in the middle. So a lot of that pressure that formed all of these fault zones, moved all these big rock units around, probably created some of the deformation that we see at Devonian Fossil Gorge. We see karst features. These are like mini caves. You've been to cave systems. You've seen sinkholes and stuff like that. This is kind of a mini version of the same thing. Uh, limestone dissolves by acetic water, and lots of times, you know, the rain falls a little acetic, and that will get in some some. Uh, uh, acetic acids from the soils and things like that. It dissolves away their limestone and you get these fossils, you get sinkholes. Well, you can have a miniature version of the same thing out of Devonian Fossil Gorge. You got many sinkholes and they're joined together and sometimes to form valleys. This is kind of what you see at Makokita Cave State Park, a solution fracture like this. Uh, the surface of all of these things is really eroded back. And uh, if you get down to look at this surface, this is a rough surface of, of all of the karst erosion uh, with the overlying rock units stripped away. You see some interesting things. This, uh, this little kid has spotted some pretty, thing, pretty interesting things. The rocks around here are the key beds. So these are the non-fossiliferous rocks, deep water deposition. But she's looking at a series of Colonial corals right here. Well, what the heck are these things doing down here in the key beds? They couldn't have lived in this environment. Well, here's what we think happened. Again, here's the rocks at Devonian Fossil Gorge shown in yellow there. We zoom in on that a little bit. There's the key beds again. We think a cave developed in here sometime like that into the key beds and it eroded up into the corals from the rapid biostrome up above. So these were the roof of the cave. And uh, these things eroded out, and fell down into the bottom of the cave where they got buried. Erosion took it down to that level and that's just what the girl's looking at, the eroded level of the limestone with the fossils that fell down in from the top of the cave embedded in the floor. Cool stuff. Just one more area I'd like to talk about, Devonia Fossil Gorge. These are the more recent rocks, the Pleistocene rocks. Well, we know the glaciers came down maybe eight or 10 times down through this area here, and then they were all around us uh, to the east with the, with the Illinois until, to the west and north with the uh, Wisconsin until. So we had affected by all of these things. We have glacial till covering this area and we have water from the floods of the running off of the Wisconsin glaciers coming through here. Well, after the 93 flood happened, right toward the top of the spillway, and you can see the apron up there to the right, so we're right near the top of the spillway, right in the middle of the spillway with all these rocks eroded around, was this big pile of unconsolidated material. It's not a rock, it's dirt. You can dig it with a shovel. Well, how come it didn't get washed away? See this rock right here in the front? This is the way we found it. It was actually facing upstream like that. So when the floodwaters came down, it hit that rock and bounced up over that part of the, the river. And you can see a rooster tail here that's caused by that rock. Well, that protected this area. So when the waters went down, this area of old riverbed was preserved. It wasn't washed away. Uh, a few years later, we had this group of psychics come from California to visit us at the Iowa Survey. And uh, Ms. Jean Pryor was lucky enough to get to talk to them. Well, it turned out there were three or four people there, and they were channeling the, the Egyptian god Ra, who told him that the key to universal world, world peace was buried down at the bottom of that pile of dirt. So they wanted to dig it out. So uh, Gene went to John Castle, who was a manager of the operations there at the time, and said, John, these people have the key to world peace buried right here. Can we dig it out? John said, no, there's no key there. We're not digging it out. So it never did get dug out. Well, that stuff slowly eroded down until just before the, the last second flood came in, in 2008. There was just a little low pile there and no key exposed yet. So maybe it's in that little low pile. Well, of course, when the other floods came, they took that whole pile away. It was gone, nothing there. So if there was the key to world peace there, uh, it's somewhere downstream in the Iowa River now. Sorry about that. Well, if you do want to see these rocks today, just walk a little further down the gorge and you'll see them exposed down there. Uh, another piece of that same river channel down here at Discovery Point uh, 14. 
Some other rocks that were deposited about that same time during the glacial periods was an old peat bog. We had a big peat bog in this area, a peat deposit. So that, that was pretty cool. Nice to see that thing. There was an erosional stone line on top of that where a bunch of glacial drift till above had must apparently been eroded out. So the only the heavier rocks lay at the top of this. And then there was some windblown lus on top of that. And a big paleosol in that lust. That's an ancient soil. So all this is good geologic information. Lots of neat stuff to study. And uh, a lot of geologists wanted to study it. But that was a pretty unstable cliff. Corps of Engineers wasn't too sure about it. So first thing they did was bulldoze that smooth so that nobody fell down and, and got hurt. And they buried a lot of that stuff. But, uh, but not all of it. <coughs> Cleared off the top pat area. Planted it all in grass. But if you look real close yet, you'll see this area of rock shown there. And uh, there's that pile of ancient river sediment still preserved there. So you can see that at least. Well, before they did all this build bulldozing, we did have a geologist come and take a look at all this lust and this big paleosol, this ancient soil that developed uh, tens of millions of years ago. And the, and the geologists that know that stuff were able to identify the Pisgah lust, the lower one, that kind of a, a more reddish looking stuff. That was lust that was produced by silt that was carried down the Iowa River by the Sheldon Creek Glacier. That was the first of the glaciers to come into Iowa about 53 to 25,000 years ago. So as it flooded, it carried this water downstream, flooded the Iowa floodplain. Uh, the silt blew up under the landscape, and this is the Pisgah lust that we see there. Then that glacier retreated and a little soil formed on top of there, that little uh, dark colored smut that you see there is the Farmdale soil. And then above that, when the Des Moines Lobe Glacier came down, the runoff from that gave us the Peoria less. So we got to learn a lot of cool things from it. <clears throat> Some other flood form features that you can see if you go out there are uh, imbricated blocks. This is Brian Witzke. You see you stand beside all these blocks that are all laid in here at an angle like somebody stacked them up. Well, what stacked them up was the floodwaters running through the reservoir. They're all stacked at about that lay angle, and that's the stable angle for the way the flood was coming down here, the strength of the water and the speed, etc. So you see a lot of them all laid out at that same angle. So when we geologists find a bunch of rocks somewhere out in the boondocks and we see them all layered like this, we say, hey, that's imbrication. There was a big flood. Uh, we got together after the first flood and put together a series of representative boulders to show all the geologic uh, units that are you can see in the Iowa City area. And you can follow right down this, this row, down the walkway, down to that Biohern Plaza down there. Well, if you take a look at that last rock down there, that biggest rock, uh, that guy was, uh, was uh, pretty prominent. But as the 2008 flood came along, the Corps decided they're going to preserve that plaza. They don't want it to get washed away. They brought all these giant 2,000-pound cement blocks and built this huge wall. You see that the stone is still back there. Uh, the floodwaters came. They eventually overwhelmed the wall. And you can see our stone is still there. But by the time everything cleared, the plaza was gone and the sun stone was gone. So that large stone got carried away by the floodwaters. As a matter of fact, if you look at another view of it here, this rock that was carried in is one of the 2,000-pound blocks that was sitting on the other side of the plaza that it dumped over here in place of that rock that was taken away. Then when the Corps of Engineers people finally came around to, to put the riprap and stuff down that they did after the 2008 flood, they had to take these here blocks out too. But the rest of these can still be seen, and, and we use them lots of times to show uh, student groups and people that come down. Some of the rocks in the Iowa City area, you can take a look at those yourself. That's one of the, the discovery points, and so it's described in the brochure. One of the most interesting things that I found down there was this feature right here. This is toward the, toward the bottom of the spillway there is this big bunch of slabs all together. If you look real close at those slabs, there seems to be re-rod connecting them. Well, obviously that's not natural limestone. Those are chunks of concrete. Those are chunks of the original Bioherm Plaza that was there. Look at there, they've been carried downstream. Well, so what happened? Well, here's where the Bioherm Plaza was. 
the floodwaters carried it about halfway down the Devonian Fossil Gorge and dumped it down there. So how'd you like to have been surfing down that spillway on that giant concrete raft? That would have been pretty cool. But there's what it looks like today. And you can still go down there and see it and crawl all over it and see the re-rod and everything. Uh, the last thing we we'll talk about is this riprap. This is a uh, riprap is what they call chunks of rock that are put somewhere to keep things from eroding away. And they wanted to keep this bank from eroding away anymore. So they, they hauled in a bunch of rocks from nearby quarries. Now, this turns out to be pretty much the same unit that you see in Devonia Fossil Gorge. It looks a lot different because this was buried a lot deeper. And so it hasn't oxidized. It's got a little more of a bluish color. But this came from the, from the Klein Quarry. It's kind of what it looks like today. So eventually, we're going to get some nice wetlands down there like we had in 2007, but we're still going to have lots of rocks to see, lots of things to, to visit, lots of things to show students. And uh, student groups come down here still by in large number. Well, I don't know if they're doing it right now, but prior to the COVID environment, uh, they used to come down here in large numbers and, and field trips to visit these rocks. If you want to know more about them, the Iowa Geological Survey has a couple of references that you can you can look up written on these. If you look at their list of publications, and there's a free handout that you can get from the core or from uh, from the survey too. So these were two of the guys who were really largely in charge of, of doing a lot of the work here. Brian Witzke and Bill Bunker, I appreciate the heck out of those. Those were both my colleagues for many, many, many years at the Iowa Survey. And this is what uh, Johnson County would have looked like 385 million years ago when these rocks were being deposited. That's all I have to say. Thanks a lot. I'll be able to hang around for any questions anybody might have. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? I know I have one. So yeah. when you guys, when you were talking about how they came and pulled chunks or rectangular spots out for display to, you know, yeah. to preserve them in an environment that wasn't, you know, subject to rain and walking on. Um, right. What kind of permissions did you need to get to be able to remove things? And is there, do people get, try to remove things today and do they get in trouble? Indeed, you would get in trouble. The Corps of Engineers has a rule that you're not able to collect any rocks in the Coralville Reservoir or any of the Corps of Engineer land. So all we had to do was get permission from the, the person that was in charge at the dam and were working with us anyway. We were cutting these out to put in his display case up there. So uh, he was all in favor of it. And, 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 you know, we don't like to do that. We would like to leave them for the public. But there's plenty of other similar things for the public. And we wanted to make sure these stayed pristine so we could so, show people a little more clearly what we're dealing with there. I'll tell you, we had a lot of people come and, and get on our case while we were cutting it out. What are you doing cutting that out? Stuff like that. Uh, several times they they actually went to, uh, I guess I can put myself on here, several times they actually went to to talk to the ranger to turn us in. I'm sorry, I couldn't oh. <laughs> They oh, they would try to turn you in for stealing. Yeah, for, for vandalizing. vandalizing. You know, I, I, there was some vandalism out there, but uh, amazingly little. Because, you know, thousands of people were come out there, and it, it's unsupervised most of the time, nobody around. We had uh, a couple of those brass monuments stolen through the years and stuff. Uh, of course, the second flood that came by destroyed most of them, so we put in a bunch of new ones, uh, aluminum ones this time. That's all we could afford this time around. But uh, everything had to be redone as far as the, the brochure and everything after the second flood. Okay, we'll get another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> had hundreds of times and stopped a few times, but I really didn't know what I was looking looking at. So I really appreciate this, right? It's very enjoyable. Well, sometimes uh, maybe we can run a field trip out there when things get better. I'd be glad to show you around. It's it's, it's really, uh, I think it must be so much more interesting to have somebody that really knows where to go to see these features because they're, they're, they're so cool. It's very rare to be able to to see bedding plane exposures like that if you're mere mortal. You know, we geologists get to go in quarries where we can see them sometimes they scrape it off. But, but uh, boy, to, to see a seafloor like this, you're walking around on a 385 million year old seafloor. Cool. <laughs> so how deep is uh, like Klein's quarry? How deep are they digging and, 
and and that sort of thing, or the, the quarry that's over by Clear Creek. How deep do they go to get the rot they're after? Well, you know, the idea is to go as, as shallow as you have to. And so they, they actually, I think that quarry probably goes down, uh, probably both of those go down, probably somewhere around 150 feet or something like that. Something in that range. There's there's several ledges that they produce, and the, the different limestone layers that I talked about all are slightly different in their composition. Some are have fossils in them, some don't. Some have uh, uh, a lot of lime mud in them, some don't. And these all have different characteristics of, of limestone, and so they're used for different purposes. So each of these ledges is is identified to the Department of Transportation, or whether it can produce concrete stone or road aggregate or or uh, uh, agricultural lime or, or whatever. So so they have several ledges that they produce different types of stone from. How long after the 93 flood did it take for geologists or somebody to realize there was this treasure there? Was it? Oh, we were, we were right on top of that because, yeah. you know, we knew what was going to happen. It actually had happened a couple other times in other places, not this large, like, like in Kansas, there was a reservoir that ran over and did that. So, so we were, yeah. we were expecting it, but it, it cut down a lot deeper than we thought, actually. So. Very interesting. I would imagine that there were a lot more souvenirs taken right afterwards by public than eventually everything else was part of the ground and wouldn't break off. So you said yeah, that years did. If the Corps of Engineers catches you taking anything out of there, you can find you, I forget, five hundred dollars, something like that, some larger amount. Although I tell you, you know, Mother Nature itself just freeze thaw and, and that sort of thing cracks loose little pieces all the time. So if you go down there now you'll see a, a lot of the original rock that you saw in those photos are covered by little pieces of, of gravel and stuff like that and they're chipped off there and uh, that, that's why it's kind of nice to see a flood every once in a while to wash all that away so we can get back to real rock again you can see things so I you know I wouldn't have any complaints if people pick up anything loose out there that's anything that you can pick up without hammering it out I'd say do it but uh, the Corps of Engineers doesn't look at it that way so you better not <laughs> if it's just free and, and broken loose like that it's not going to be around long anyway so but but we, we geologists have a license, we can do that. <laughs> or at least I, I could when I worked for the survey, I can now legally.